Hare Krishna Vaisheshika Prabhu. Thank you very much for joining for the Monks podcast today. It's been a long cherished desire to have your association here. So thank you for sparing your time and coming. Prabhu, there's no place I'd rather be. Please accept my obeisances and tell everyone who's watching Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Prabhu, I thought today, now it's Bhadra Purnima also coming on, and also I thought of, you know, book distribution is a very important part of our movement and our tradition. At the same time, you know, what I observe whenever I have in Silicon Valley is that, you know, from book distribution to say heart transformation and community building, that is something which you have done quite remarkably. So I thought we could uh, discuss that topic today, if that's okay with you. I'd love to. One of my favorite topics. Yes, really. thank you. So if we look at the history of our movement, you know, we were defined as the people who dance on the streets and distribute the books. There was some survey I was reading recently that they, when people were asked in America in the 1970s, how many Hare Krishnas are there? The estimate of Americans was almost 100 times more than the actual number of devotees, like average Americans, because you know, we were so visible. Uh, at the same time, it did happen that while doing book distribution, uh, the other part of the whole thing, the you know, cutting care of devotees and building communities, uh, that, that sometimes uh, was not given the due attention. But you have managed that uh, balance where, in fact, rather than seeing book distribution as something which, uh, which individual devotees go and uh, do, you have, in fact, redefined book distribution as, a, as an activity which brings the community together. The entire family goes out and distribute books. Uh, and whenever devotee families go out, and it's become a strong community building exercise. So, how did this? Uh, was this a conscious decision that you made, or it was just by experience gradually, uh, like re-strategizing happened? Uh, yes, Prabhu. Uh, I noticed that that over time, since I joined ISKCON in 1973, there are various eras, and in each one of them there were various necessities that people had. In the beginning, there was quite a bit of community building through book distribution because when you go out and meet people and talk to them where they live, on the streets, in their homes, then eventually you're going to meet sincere seekers who are going to want to find out more about what you do and where you live. And we did have ashrams that were quite full. Uh, during the 1970s, when I lived in ashrams, there were often uh, not much space. <laughs> there were so many okay. people coming. Uh, in the 1980s, I, I did start to notice that the economic necessities changed. Sometimes, well, not sometimes, every time people's lives change, they grow up and they have different needs, like economic needs. So a lot of, a lot of people living in ashrams uh, got married and they went out and they had to find jobs and so forth. And that, that made a big difference. Uh, <clears throat> I noticed that uh, when we started our community here in Silicon Valley, that people were, were best uh, taking care of their own necessities economically and that they could have their solid unit and also participate in the most important aspects of Krishna consciousness at the temple and have a, a good um, connection with everybody else. So uh, just in brief, in brief summary, that, that what I noticed was that so many people thought that book distribution was only about uh, brahmacharis or monks uh, who were uh, free to do so going out uh, full time. It had been compartmentalized. But I felt as a householder, when I became a householder, that it, it was a mainstay of my ashram. And we just instituted that in Silicon Valley, where there happened to be a, a few householders. And then the trend grew, and we kept book distribution as a, a centerpiece, because community means there's some common purpose, as you mentioned. Mm. So overall... And this is not only, you could say, not only was book distribution sustained and given a new, 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 could say new, new dimension, but it also changed the public perception. You know, when devotees as a family go out for distribution, then that doesn't, it doesn't seem as if we are a cult. It is more of a 
more of an inclusive family friendly image also so that has also helped us to grow out of the cult perceptions that people had sometimes about us isn't it yeah that's very true actually when we go door to door with uh whole families uh, mm. people are uh just as an experiment, you know, there's peepholes on doors. When we've done a lot of door-to-door book distribution. In fact, Prabhupada mentions it in the seventh canto of the Bhagavatam in Prahlad's prayers that the purpose of the of the devotees is to go door-to-door. He brings that up a lot. So we try. Mm-hmm. We didn't go door-to-door. We still go door-to-door. And people look out through those little holes before they decide whether they're going to open the door or not. Yeah. And just um, anecdotal studies, but we notice that if there's women and children outside uh, mixed you know, with everybody else, then they don't mind opening the door. If there's one man or a couple of men, it's it's less likely that they'll open it right away. Mm. So yeah, and and in general, it's people like to see people who look like them and get an idea that yeah, this is a participatory uh, program. You can you can join in and and can be part of it. But I think also that you know Indian householders in America. This is our experience are highly effective at teaching Krishna consciousness to Westerners. This was another crossover because, yeah, we find that um, they're seen as authorities because kind of they are in a lot of ways. It's their culture and they know a lot about it. And so, but there's, there's a sense when I see Indians talking to Westerners that they think, wow, you must know about this. We're going to listen. So that's helpful also. Oh, that's interesting. You know, when, uh, when, uh, since I, when I started coming abroad from 2014 from outside India, so many times when I would give Western classes, uh, many times people would ask me this question, where are you born in this culture? So I had never been asked this question in India. So it seems that if you're born into a culture, as contrasted with if you became a convert to the culture, if you're born, you see, it seems you, they consider you have more authenticity. Is it something like that? Yeah. It is. And to some degree, it's true. <laughs> I mean, to some degree that, you know, it's so ingrained. But uh, yeah, that that's true. And there's, it seems when somebody's teaching from another country, people sort of, yeah, make an assumption that uh, they, they must know about it. So that's also a helpful feature. Oh, that's fascinating. So if I, what you're saying is that when Indians go out for distribution, they are also able to connect with Westerners, not just Indians. And very much so. And it, yeah, oh. yeah, that's true. It very much warms my heart. When I first started seeing our <clears throat> Indian uh, devotees, householders uh, go out, for instance, to Haight Ashbury, it's an iconic place where the counterculture started, the hippie movement. In the 1960s, yeah, it's, it's the movement took hold, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and and we see all these photos coming in of these um, Indians. Some of them, you know, come from Brahmin families, and they hadn't had much experience with Westerners, but they were delighted to meet these people, hippies. There still are hippies there. And the, and the others were just delighted to meet them. And you can see the photos and see the results. It's it's very heartwarming. And it's a nice mix. Amazing. You know, that is one of the concerns that many devotees feel that, uh, are, uh, that one, one reason why Western outreach is not happening much is because our temples are being uh, in some ways, some ways dominated by Hindus or Indians. But you're saying that even Indians can be effective to connect with Westerners. Absolutely. And and as far as, I mean, there are two aspects to the outreach in book distribution, more than two aspects, but two main aspects are when we first meet somebody and then there has to be some place for them to go. And it's, it is true that many of the temples in North America certainly are packed up with uh, Indian devotees. But um, in that case, we have to make special arrangements because, as I like to say, every species has its habitat that it can survive in. There was an experiment out here 
near where I live in California uh, along the coast to bring back a species called the red legged frog. The leg, leg, okay. red legged frog is a very important chain in the economic, in the Ecolog ecological system. And that it, it had all but gone extinct. So the, there were these biologists who created, again, recreated the habitat of the red legged frog. Okay. And then it came back. And so when I saw that, I was thinking that if we want a specific kind of person to thrive in Krishna consciousness, we have to create an environment where they feel comfortable. And uh, when that's not there, you can distribute a book, but then where are they going to go next? They have to, if, for instance, a Westerner has to have a place where he or she sees other Western people and it's being presented in a way that they can understand it in their language. Language is so important, uh, just the terminologies that we use and uh, the approach to ex explaining. So that is a vital point that is uh, just being developed uh, now, there are areas where certain devotees have taken that to heart, but it, it's um, we've had really good success with it during the pandemic, developing new ways to bring in Westerners. But it is uh, especially important to have habitat for the kinds of people. You can't just throw them in, in any habitat and expect them to survive. That's a beautiful term, you know, habitat. It makes so, such immediate sense. And we, we can say ultimately Krishna consciousness is a spiritual habitat. But before people can experience the spiritual habitat, they need to experience it some, at some level of cultural or social acceptability and comfort. Only then they can and sustainably connect with the spiritual habitat also. Yeah. It's so true, Prabhu. And then Prabhupada brings it up in, the, in his uh, commentary about Gajendra. He mentions how Gajendra, the oh, elephant... Yeah was yeah. struggling because he was in the water, even though he's the king of the jungle and so strong and everyone respected him. And he, on the land, he would have defeated the crocodile. But Prabhupada mentions that everyone needs to have sensory strength and power of, uh, and co feel comfortable in, in, in his or her environment in order to prosecute Krishna consciousness. Yukta Hara Viharasya. That's fascinating. So, Jindra, sorry to interrupt you. That's, I had always thought of no, that no, no. in the ashram. But I think it doesn't have to apply to the ashram. It can apply in general to the environment where a person can be comfortable and can flourish. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, the last few years, I, I've been, uh, as per my spiritual master's instruction, trying to assist in Western outreach. So I read some books about how things are the religious landscape in America. So I read a quote by Martin Luther King. He said that the church hour is the most sectarian hour in America. What mm. he meant by that is, people for church, they go to people of their own denominations. So, for example, Latin Americans will go to Latin place where they're Latin Americans. So, it's and to some extent, when I thought about it, it's true in India also. So, it's a holy place is not just a holy place for spiritual coming together. It's also for cultural, social coming together. So, yeah. So, so have you devised some like uh, like in Silicon Valley? I visited. We have one main temple. But have we also got some smaller separate centers or what is the arrangement or what is the habitat that can be created uh, in a realistic way for uh, non-Indians also to join, connect with Krishna consciousness regularly? Well, a couple experiences I've had. I visited uh, a couple of times Rick Warren's temple down in Southern California. Okay. And uh, it's called Saddleback. Saddleback. He's been really okay. successful. I read his book, Purpose which is driven. called The Purpose Driven Church. Um, okay. He has a bestseller called The Purpose Driven Life, which is well known, less well known as The, the Purpose, Purpose Driven. Driven Church, which is <laughs> definitely a handbook for anybody who wants to <laughs> uh, embark on this creation of a uh, community that develops habitat. So he has a mantra on his campuses, and they are vast, uh, you know, sprawling uh, facilities for people to come. Uh, he has various centers, for instance, on one property. He doesn't have just one church worship center, but he has several. And they're divided for young people, people who speak Spanish, people who like traditional 
uh, program and other people who like more cutting edge. So he has at least four, maybe it's three, maybe three or four different worship centers on one campus. Uh, and so they say, same message, different music. That's their mantra there. So the music, the soundscape makes such a difference in people's lives, but that's indicative of the, the, the thinking of those who are on the cutting edge, whether in Krishna consciousness or in Christianity, of how to get the unchurched and bring them into the fold. Oh, and okay. yes, we have uh, been doing that. Uh, we had the benefit during the, uh, the pandemic of trying our experiment, especially online. So um, Jai Madhava Prabhu and Bhavani Bhakti, a couple here who's very interested in Western outreach, they're uh, Indians, but uh, the, the expert in uh, digital transformation, but also they have compassionate hearts and, and wanted to reach out to the Westerners. So they developed this uh, bhakti community, which uh, was scientifically created by interviewing all the best Western outreach uh, uh, creators and uh, forming it around the base these principles. And it's it's flourishing. It, it fits the the formula: create the create the habitat, and the species will survive. And so now we have a place at least digitally, and we'll bring that more into the, the physical uh, as the, uh, the pandemic lessens, that uh, people are thriving. And we have uh, hundreds of people online on our Bhakti community who are regulars and who are participating and learning, and they're taking 52-week classes that progressively teach Krishna consciousness. And... Uh, 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 we're finding that it, the formula works, yes. Well, 52 weeks is substantial. I mean, that means if somebody goes to that much, they are definitely interested and committed, and they will get a quite a holistic experience of Krishna consciousness. Okay. Yes, definitely. Yeah, so it, uh, what it seems to me, basically with respect to Western outreach, I've seen two different models, in one sense where we have two separate centers uh, for, in some parts of the world, where in New Zealand, for example, there is a Western Outer Center, there is a local temple for Indians. And the two works systematically, steadily separately. There are some places where you have a separate center for Western Outer, and eventually they join towards a one main temple community. But what you said in Saddleback is like they have separate things for separate people itself. So do you envision the two streams eventually uniting or like both streams will eventually in their own tracks move toward Krishna? We'll, we'll let you know. We'll <laughs> let you know if we can merge them together. Okay. But what I've observed is, if you're going to have it all in one place, everybody uh, who's part of the the host community should be inculcated, must be inculcated with the idea that this is for outsiders. Because as you mentioned before, birds of a feather flock together, mm-hmm. and uh, Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, you know, it's the most sectarian hour. So we have to build an awareness that we're, we're there not just for ourselves to congregate and feel good with our friends. But uh, from the beginning of ISKCON, we already, or, or I should say at the beginning of ISKCON, there was this pervasive sense that when people, new guests came, they were the priority. And uh, it's, it's true in any group, not just in ISKCON, that you know, we tend to go, tend towards our comfort zone. And that means I sit with my friends, the people I like, and, mm. and uh, ignore the new people because, like, who are they to come in here? I'm not saying anybody thinks like that, but that, that could be, that could, it could trend that far. So we really have to, um, it requires inculcation and very deliberately setting up uh, programs, if you're going to merge them, so that when people come, whoever they may be, I find even some Indians aren't uh, up to the (laughs) speed that, uh, you know, they walk in, there's so many prayers. I had somebody uh, say once, an an Indian couple, they were younger, but there was like, why so many prayers? And what are all these things? It's, It's foreign to a lot of people, we don't know how fast we're going <laughs> sometimes or how absorbed we are in um, doing things that uh, and not being aware 
that uh, of what other people think of it. So that perspective is is vitally important, and it always helps when we uh, take time to reconsider who's this for, and when we direct it towards others. It's very healthy for the community actually, because when new people come in, everybody vicariously experiences Krishna consciousness anew as they're seeing it through their eyes. Right. Uh, this is great. And look how new people love this. Uh, I should love it 10 times more. That's a beautiful phrase. Ex- vicariously experience Krishna consciousness anew. It's so true. That otherwise, if we are we are doing only... See, there's a special joy in reaching out to new people. We can do Bhakti Shastri courses. We can do Bhagavatam classes. And it's wonderful to go into scriptures. But there is a very different and special rasa in introducing somebody new to new to Krishna consciousness and seeing, you could say, seeing their eyes light up, seeing the jigsaw puzzles fall in place in their heads. You know, just life starts becoming meaningful. And then in that sense, our, our service starts feeling deeply meaningful also. Otherwise, sometimes we may just feel that I'm just expanding the numbers of my group. Sometimes, although we know it's a transcendental activity, it can just seem like a... Uh, simply like a number increasing activity, but that connecting with new people is very enlivening. Exactly. Yes. And it's the testing of our mantras, just as in ancient Vedic times, they would beautiful test mantras by, okay. you know, sacrifice and bring it back to life. And that can our mantras are what, is what we are saying to other people life-giving? Does it bring them back to life? Can we watch it before our eyes that they actually have this, the, the symptoms of Krishna consciousness that are mentioned in, in the Bhagavad Gita and elsewhere? And, and when that happens, and it does, then it reconfirms for us that the mantras work, and then we lean in them to them harder. So there's a symbiotic relationship. We have to be bringing in brand new people all the time for our culture to survive mm. and not become insular. That's and then the amagraha sets in. Yeah, that's true. So when you earlier said that there's an inculcation that this is for everyone, and I it does seem that as a community grows, maybe we need different levels of programs also. Some programs where devotees come together seriously for hearing Shastra and going deeper into their lives. And then other programs where people, where, they, where there's opportunity, what is also come, but there's opportunity for new people to come in. So this I have noticed that you also created a very vibrant culture of hearing over there. You, are you, you, have, you have solid two, two and a half hour, three hour class. In fact, I have, been, I have been coming to America a lot of time and I have talked with many other preachers. They say among all the places in the West, coming to Silicon Valley is like spiritual sense gratification. <laughs> because, the, <laughs> because the community there is so eager to hear. Of course, there's wonderful communities everywhere. But there the community is so eager to hear. So how did this, was this also your personal conscious focus from the beginning to create a culture of hearing or that also grew con- gradually? Well, Prabhu, first of all, hearing such news warms my heart, I must say. It uh, really does. Thank you. And, um, you know, it's the culture I grew up in. I became a a member of Krishna consciousness as a brahmachari. I was young, uh, youngish at the time. I was 16. And I I was fortunate. I was connected with uh, leadership that really emphasized hearing and chanting. In fact, it was reinforced by um, a, a meeting I had with, among other devotees, we went together and met Prabhupada. That was my first time I had his... Uh, darshan. And uh, we had reported scores. In other words, we were sitting in front of Prabhupada as neophyte devotees, and Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada was listening to the te- our temple president um, give a report about how many books we were distributing. And then Prabhupada looked at us and said, you must also read my books. I've not written them just for selling. I've written them for you to read, become pure devotees, and go back to Godhead. I was so impressed with that. And I already had that experience myself before I came to Krishna consciousness. I had collected several of Prabhupada's books before meeting devotees and devoured them. And that that was my mainstay and my my strong connection. 
And when I first walked in the temple to join, uh, when I said, is the guru here? I'd like to you know, become a disciple. And they said, no, he's not here. He's in India. And I said that they saw how I was disappointed and said, but don't worry, he always lives in his books. So I thought, yeah, that's true. I, I can appreciate that principle. In any case, there are, there are various influences uh, on my life about the importance of hearing and chanting. And when, pause, when so I got in... Sorry to interrupt you. So the first time you entered a temple, your first question was, how can I become a disciple or I want to become a disciple, is it? That's remarkable. Yeah, I had assumed that the guru would be there. And I, I was like, that's it. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I want this. I, I thought it'll happen this day, <laughs> this very day. And, and, and they, they say, they sort of chuckled. It's like, you know, where'd you come from? They, he's not here, you know, like, you know, who are you, kid? You know, so. Uh, this was 1974. Yes. 1974. Pardon? Was it? Was it 1974? Uh, yeah, I, I, I walked in the temple in the summer of 1973. 73, okay. And, mm. and uh, I, 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 I was fortunate to have had association with those who understood the, the importance of hearing chanting and that it's the genesis of any uh, development of community, of success in any project in Krishna consciousness. Srinivatam Svakata Krishna, Punya Shravana Kirtana. It, mm. one has to have a healthy diet of hearing and chanting. And there's no limit to how much you can hear and chant. It's not, uh, you know, it's nityam bhagavata sevaya. We, that's what I felt from Prabhupada, permission, like hear and chant as much as you wish. You know, it's not regimented to the point like it can only be a 30 minute class or 40 minute class. No, hear as much as possible. I'll just say, Prabhu, when, when, when I got involved with this kind of Silicon Valley, mm. I noticed that devotees didn't have a lot of time because they have to work hard. But our um, conception, my thought about how it could be a successful community was based on Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was mentioning that there are five especially potent processes of Krishna consciousness that have if adhered to, will guarantee the success of the practitioner, even if he or she does not have complete faith in them, and even has a little contact with them. So devotees couldn't come every day. And so we made it a point to have longer contact time when we were together, especially in these five, and especially in hearing and chanting. And it works. It always works. And if you don't have something to offer, by uh, having a, the experience of how transformative hearing from Prabhupada's books is, then it's very difficult to go out and present to other people. And the, uh, just to keep a run-on sentence going here, there's a way in which when devotees do go out to distribute books, even if they uh, haven't had a lot of experience with hearing and chanting, we find that they want to hear and chant because they start thinking like, what's in these books? <laughs> And the, the okay. two complement each other. They, they oh, go together okay. like rice and dal. Both good foods, but when you put them together, you get 32% more nutrition, according to Jamuna's cookbook. Okay. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, and it is very much true. Generally, if we are not really interacting with new people in trying to share, and there is no, we don't feel the impetus to go deeper into our books also. Okay. It's like, as you said earlier, we're in a comfort zone. And so, so in one sense, we can, you can say he, hearing and chanting makes us more comfortable, but to experience that comfort, we have to go out of our comfort zone. That inspires us to take shelter in one sense. Maybe shelter is a better word than comfort, but yeah, that's true. Symbiotic. Mm, yes, true. Yes. In fact, we have a saying that uh, yeah. you should learn to be comfortable outside your comfort zone and uncomfortable in your comfort zone. Okay, that's true. You know? So be comfortable outside your comfort zone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In one sense, that is what, uh, what I think Prabhupada said that, you know, that whenever you do some service or if you talk about charity, you give it till it hurts slightly at least. I think that's a similar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that's effective <laughs> yes, not the extra that you didn't 
that you didn't care about anyway, right? <laughs> yes, Ravi, that's true. So just going back to this earlier, your point mentioned the striking that um, longer contact time. So one of the things I observed is that when, especially in the Western world where most devotees are householders, a daily Bhagavatam class is not really practical. And then trying to institute that or impose that, it becomes a, it becomes a drain for most devotees, even those who are giving class and those who feel it's like an obligation to attend. So, but on the other hand, I think you have two or three programs, Wednesday evening and then Sunday morning. And then it's like devotees are eager to come and they, they are very eager to come and participate and they look forward to it and are nourished by it. So was this also a conscious decision to, like you said, based on people's requirements that we would uh, arrange those programs? Yeah, uh, we started with one class and then incrementally increased it according to the, the interest and capacity of the devotees. And we just fell into a pattern of Wednesday night and then Saturday morning and then Sunday. However, there's, as everybody knows, we have more holidays in uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavism than maybe any other religion in the world. Yeah. <laughs> so those, those, are the, those are the steadies, uh, steady days. But then obviously they're augmented regularly by the, the holy days. And we make it a point, for instance, on John Mashtami to keep the vibration going all day long. Start early in the morning and don't stop until after midnight. And there's all, you know, the, the hearing, chanting, discussing goes on constantly. Okay. And also uh, offline, there's the devotees have developed a taste. So there's Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Bhai Bhav, Bhakti Vedanta going on. And then the devotees have their own reading groups uh, constantly, especially during the pandemic. This really helped because the community was able to cohese over the internet and they were interested in hearing and chanting. And a lot of them got even more opportunity to meet and, 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 and hear and chant. But yes, we started with just, you know, what we could do uh, according to people's schedules uh, to get together at ISV and hear and chant. In the beginning, there was just a few devotees coming uh, that could come. But everything always expands when you hear and chant from Prabhupada's books. It all comes from that. That's the revelation. Just like when Prabhupada came, he concentrated on these simple activities, chanting, publicly and then having a discussion he would speak and ask people to uh, discuss ask questions and from there every all the magic happens it, it's the the place where um, people start to develop faith just by hearing and when they have faith then they naturally want to move in the direction of helping spread the Christian consciousness movement without that uh, nothing moves that's true. This is a good point. Rather than what you're saying is, you start with what is possible and it will naturally expand. Rather than like set a very high, this is what you have to do and then make it, it can seem like a, a too much of a demand for people. So naturally, if it grows, then it is something which is uh, relishably done by devotees rather than seeing as a ritual or a burden. That's true. Yes, Prabhu. And I'm, I've had the benefit of being able to sit there and watch people come and sit for, for you know, week after week. And then you see a light goes off in their head that like, hey, I'm going to do this. <laughs> and like, how does it happen? Just through the process that Prophet told us to do. Uh, just hear, discuss thoroughly, you know, what's in the books. That's another point is that it. I find that it's helpful to have at least some of the the meeting time when we're hearing and chanting to be um, participatory. When yeah, devotees that was the next get question to I was going to ask you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things which I find striking about your classes is that uh, it's, uh, there are some speakers who have such a, uh, such a capacity to speak katha that people can just sit and hear for hours. And not everybody can do that. Now, you have that power to do that. But at the same time, what you do is, you engage the people. So you ask for reflections. And not only have you, you ask for it, but it's like people participate. You see very serious, substantial reflections the audience gives. So that is something quite distinctive. In modern teaching methods, they do talk about it a lot. But I have not seen that 
uh, although you know, based on our meeting a few years ago i also tried tried to do reflections but it requires a culture for for participants you know to actually open up in a spiritual program and speak so how did you get this idea and how, how has it developed over the years well first of all chaitanya charan prabhu i have no power at all to be frank but uh, if you say it from your lips to the lord's ears some day i might have a modicum of power an iota somewhere uh yeah participatory it, it's true that sometimes i i'll take the same format that i'm used to here at isv and i'll uh, induce people to participate and they look at me like wait a minute can you do that <laughs> are you supposed to be doing this is this okay and and it, it does take a, a while to uh, get everyone used to uh, speaking one of the ways we've uh, worked on it here at isv is to make sure that uh just on a very basic level that our sound system is top rate we have about five microphones that float in the audience so that oh. every and everyone's trained to speak into the microphone i mean part of it is just being able to hear one another is really important and emphasizing uh the you know top rate um facility you know for discussions to take place because uh I don't know how they did it and I'm a sharmi prabhu I mean <laughs> somebody <laughs> wanted to say something and the atmosphere was different I, I suppose but uh yeah it it takes practice and once people get a taste for thinking about the material and then you know giving their own uh, either reflection which I, is what I like to say you know reflect on it and then it it develops into a culture where people like to participate in it and you know ownership turns sand into gold and they start to uh feel mu- much more part of it and it fleshes out the conversation when uh when people are participating i just mentioned oh. a, about how you know when kids are involved also uh mm. and they start to develop in in shastra which is uh, something I'll talk about in a minute if you'd like but yeah. uh, when they get involved and they can start reflecting you notice everyone starts noticing at the the capacity that that kids have and everyone um there's a kind of synergy that takes place when these discussions go on in the uh in the classes that I find is very helpful oh okay yeah in one sense uh, just if audience starts reflecting on an average i have seen the for some an audience member starts reflecting the remaining audience is much more attentive than when the speaker is because the speaker has been speaking for a long time and if the audience is a child it's almost uh, complete attention so that's so true and uh, that was something which i was going to ask you but just before this so how did you come up with this idea was it just you observed that uh, devotees could be better engaged with this or was it some teaching skills in contemporary world you observe that's that's what affects that's what works in for kalyuga minds which are quite easily distracted or how did you come well, up <laughs> now that you mentioned and i can't remember how i got into it uh you know doing it like that i really if it comes to my mind you know how that started i'll 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 mention it but i i can't think of it right now i on now it's what i remember is it's it's been, we've been doing it for so long yes and it's just part of the culture now yes true that's so true and uh, it just of course when we are having courses like bhakti shastra in other places there it works i have also been able to do that because the audience knows the speaker well and then it can, it is much easier to do it but it also in one sense it's not just uh, shravan and then almost becomes like bodhayanta parasparam so what krishna is telling and that is much more relishment 10.9 dushyanti cha ramanti cha so that's beautiful so now is going back to the next point i felt that one aspect of community building which is quite distinctive is uh, whenever i come there you have so many children and i to talk with the devotees parents also they told how you know you have you yourself spend a lot of time with the children and they open up with you so nicely so that is a major concern for devotees in in the in the west especially indian devotees i would say for all parents it's a concern about the direction the children are taking 
but especially for indian indian parents in the west so uh, in fact uh, even if the parents themselves are not so serious about uh, their own tradition or their culture they want their children to at least be aware of it so how did uh, the the children outreach or children uh, children education how has that been shaped over over the decades i have to admit it was a revelation to me about kids i'm the youngest of four children in my family so as the youngest i had no younger siblings to take care of or to, or to know when i joined the christian conscious movement i'm younger than most of my god brothers i mean i have a few god brothers and god sisters i have a few that i'm in contact with that were initiated when they were 13 and 14 and so forth but um uh, i didn't I didn't really uh, have much appreciation for kids. I always, as you know, I was a brahmachari for 13 years and a, a lot of that contributed to my feeling like, well, kids just disturb the class often and they're, <laughs> they're not that useful. Um, I, I hadn't developed part of my brain. I mean, there's still many parts I haven't developed. Oh. Uh, but yeah. uh, growing up at Iskon Silicon Valley, it was a great benefit to me uh, not growing up there, but being there since the beginning and watching kids grow up in Krishna consciousness. Uh, at first, yes, I was, I'd noticed that they disturbed the class and whatever, but then I started taking more of an interest in them. Uh, one incident that happened was I was, I was curious about whether kids uh, would be interested in, and could actually distribute books starting at five years old. So I took a group uh, uh, with chaperones helping me of kids uh, who were five out on book distribution door to door to just to show them how to do it. And they were fascinated by it. They loved it. We had such an outing. Then from then on, every time we'd ask if the kids wanted to go out on book distribution, they'd raise both hands. Everybody wanted to go out. And I also saw people's reactions uh, to these bright faced uh, children, you know, coming with us who were explaining what the Bhagavad Gita is in their own simple way. And people just buy the books. Uh, like the, uh, one day I was with these five, five-year-olds and we approached somebody's house and there was a woman out on her porch and there was a white picket fence around her house. And I, I was, uh, you know, sort of communicating with her non-verbally, but she looked and she goes, she noticed, you know, me and a dhoti and the kids. And she said, no, thanks. I'm a Christian. The kids didn't know what that meant. And they just sort of filed through the, <laughs> through the gate <laughs> and surrounded her and started showing Bhagavad Gita and said, this is the cow and here's Krishna and this and that. And she, she was so charmed by them. I stayed out outside the gate, but she looked over to me and she goes, all right, how much is it? And I thought, yeah, this, this is a, a nice program. But then uh, I started noticing all the qualities of the kids that these are unusual children to be born in these uh, families or to have come to Christian consciousness in an early age. And they had an unusually uh, high acumen for for hearing and chanting and learning. And I also found out that kids thrive, and this is tr uh, true through study also. There's the Sanskrit effect study, that when mm -hmm. kids learn long um, strings of, of Sanskrit verses, they go into a kind of a trance. So we started doing this. Uh, we, we had um, kids' book distribution, which has thrived. And a lot of these kids grew up distributing books, and it's a way in which they've been able to integrate into the world in a safe way, so they know what it is. And, but they're, it, it's within the context of presenting Krishna consciousness to others. So it's not this abrupt change, you know, there's this world, that world. It's vidyam cha vidyam cha yas, tad vedo bayam saha. One can learn the process of nescience and transcendental knowledge side by side, can transcend the influence of repeated birth and death and enjoy the full blessings of immortality. That's sort of our theme verse. <laughs> and, so and so then I spent more and more time with the kids. And uh, there's a lot more to be said about that. But uh, community means kids. The community means kids because they bring everything together. If the kids are thriving and they thrive by seeing peers doing well, and when they thrive, then the parents uh, become happy at heart and they want to participate more. And they do participate more because their kids are eager 
to be in Krishna consciousness. You can see I get exuberant about this, so I'll stop there. And let you say <laughs> oh, I think we can be exuberant hearing about this. I was just imagining when you played the word five, five years old, I was imagining, you know, must be a very sweet sight. So five years? I have five... photos. I have photos of that time. You know, and it, it's, they're relishable. Yeah, so five-year-old is quite young, but if they start, for them, it's like adventure. You know, they're going out of their home and doing something new. I think Prabhupada also says in one letter that, you know, if children are trained, then austerity can also be like fun for them. So, of course, Bhagavad is not exactly an austerity, but it's, it can be quite an adventure. I never thought of it like that. And for the kids, it's going to meet, meet them strangers and tell them something. It's quite a new thing, a, a exciting thing for them to do. Hmm. Yes, Prabhupada. Oh, yeah, Prabhupada. It, it's definitely an austerity to walk out the door and go out into public not knowing what's going to happen or whether you're going to get refused. I think mentally it's the greatest austerity and there's some physical austerity involved also. But what I find is that uh, when anybody goes out for book distribution, they develop what I call street smarts. They start to see how the world works and that it's not theoretical anymore. The three modes of material nature become revealed to them right before their eyes. They also learn how to communicate. And I find with kids, when they start doing it from a young age, they become so expert at everything, how to handle Lakshmi, how to organize themselves, how to speak to uh, somebody you've never met before. How to, and this is invaluable. You can go get a master's PhD in something and be completely inept at social skills or, or communication or, or getting along with other people. The emotional intelligence doesn't develop. But through book distribution, combined with hearing and chanting, you get the, the super kids. You get super kids. And it also counteracts the, the per, possible pernicious effects of sending kids off to these big institutions where they get all kinds of um, perhaps uh, association that's not so favorable. Mm -hmm. they, 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 gotta, they have to come out of the community uh, fortified and uh, with, with a taste, a momentum. So they're giving association, not drinking it in. So having this book distribution in, in the community for kids, along with intensive hearing and chanting, which they can, they develop into it. And that just becomes their norm. They turn into uh, what we want them to turn into as perfectly integrated human beings who are Krishna conscious and, and can live a Krishna conscious lifestyle and also uh, show by example and by their precept how to, how others can do it too. Wow. Yeah, I never thought about this this way. It's a whole universe. Uh, when you earlier mentioned the Vidyamcha, Vidyamcha, I was thinking how it would imply, but it's true. In some ways, uh, if kids are going, going, this is, I think, social studies also been there that if kids are growing in a very culture that is very different from the mainstream culture, then for them to go out, it is a challenge. In fact, if you consider the most insular culture in the West, probably the Amish culture, and they have that period when the kids can go out and wander in the world, something like Rumshkrang, they call it, and then they come back. Some of them come, some of them don't. But this is a very, you could say, a very uh, safe as well as effective way of giving them contact with the world. And the idea of yeah, social, social skills being developed or emotional intelligence being developed that's amazing. You can't function in Bhagavad without that. So that's so beautifully true. Uh -huh. so, so this, I'd, this I'd also mention that, you know, basic things, uh, important skills to develop. I think one of the most important skills to develop, I don't know if I'd call it a skill, but it, it's the, the ability to process rejection. People don't like to get rejected. Our ego becomes offended and so forth. You learn that on book distribution. And one of our uh, teachers who's facilitated uh, kids' book distribution for uh, a couple of decades now, Kameshwari Dasi, uh, and she tells about one of the first kids' book distribution sorties she took out and uh, the, the, somebody opened the door and then get out of here, slam the door. We don't, you know, and the kids were taken aback. So they went out, it was an apartment complex. They sat together in the playground area and she helped them process it. What just happened here? Because some of the kids were a little shocked. You know, why would somebody not like us 
a priori <laughs> before meeting us. And see, they talked about it. These kids have experienced that already. I mean, you know, for anybody who's skilled in something, they have to be able to have this ability to go out and face rejection. And if, if you've learned that skill, nothing can stop you anymore. That's amazing. I think that's one of the main reasons why in college life becomes more difficult because in say kids at home, they are protected by the provided by their parents, but in, the, in college, you know, you are not, and you have to find handle rejection from friends, from, from various places. So that's amazing. So uh, in one sense, you could say book description is almost like a crucible where character is being built while we are actually giving uh, Prabhupada's mercy to others. But it's not just that, say we are of course spiritually benefited, but even from this world's perspective, the character is being shaped in a very tangible and valuable way. Prabhu, we've changed that to the main point. But the way I present book distribution is that it is high sadhana. And the reason we're doing book distribution is for our own purification. When you start with that baseline, then there's no reason to not go out. It's a sadhana. It's part of our practice. Everything else is extra. Whether we distribute books or not is inconsequential. The fact that you went out, you crossed the threshold, you went out for your own purification to go beyond your comfort zone. And you, you did the right thing. You tried it. That's the sadhana. And there are other aspects, you know, to hear and chant before you go out and so forth. The four laws of book distribution, starting with your sadhana must be strong. That's where we start with book distribution. And that's what we teach. And then nobody's disappointed because oftentimes people say, well, I can't distribute any books. So that's not the point. The point is to go out with the other devotees and do sankirtan, which means sam samya kirtan. And when you do that, you'll improve in devotional service. That's why we're doing it. Don't worry about distributing the books. That happens automatically. That's true. In one sense, you are practically applying karma nevadi karaste. Krishna says, don't be attached to the results. <laughs> so... Yeah, that's amazing. So when we are talking about book distribution, uh, you talked about many aspects now. So to what extent do you feel that the book distribution uh, translates into people becoming devotees? Say, in, from your experience in Silicon Valley, now at one level, we know Krishna says Manushyanam Sahasreshu, so one among thousand. And even if people come for a program, so like in India, we do, uh, there are, there are, Bhagavad courses or whatever. So thousands of people may come for a Janmashtami festival, but very few will say register for any course or any regular connection. So is there some, some kind of one book distribution is we travel to different places and distribute books like a bus party, but what you have also focused on with your community model is more in a particular area which is where people can access, have access to a community. So how, how has that worked out in terms of uh, from book distribution to the journey of people coming to a temple, uh, is that a major way people are joining the community also? Yes, it is. Uh, there's a direct correlation. There's a one-to-one -one correlation that can be measured. However, uh, to understand the efficacy of book distribution, one must start study gardening. Because uh, the gardener knows that there are certain amounts of seeds, as mentioned in the Bible also, that, that when landing on uh, certain types of soil will have uh, their, their, their ultimate effect. Uh, yeah. I got a couple of seeds when I was in Mayapur uh, from a tamarind pod. In fact, actually, I was, I was visiting a, a holy place with Janani Vas Prabhu, and he picked up a pod off the ground, a tamarind, he said, here, crack it open and eat it. And it happened to be a tree under which Lord Chaitanya and Nityananda had danced. So I did, and then I kept the seeds, and I brought them home, and I said, oh, I'll try to plant them. And I put them in the ground after following the directions I found on YouTube, how to grow tamarind seeds. And lo and behold, they didn't come up. So I just thought, well, what can you do? I tried. And uh, mm -hmm. however, I kept watering them. And a few weeks after 
the initial period where I thought they'd come up, they came up and I started dancing uh, in ecstasy. Like, wow, they're there. So we have to trust seeds. There is no book that ever goes out that doesn't have an effect. This is uh, absolutely true. The holy name has its effect. Nama Chintamani Krishnas. And these books, Tadvagvi Sargo Janataga Viplavo Yasmin Prati Shlokam Abadya Bhaktipi Namanyanantasya. They're full of the names of the Lord. They can't not be effective. It's impossible. So the seeds will have their effect. We have to understand that. But Gardner knows that where we place the seeds under different conditions, they'll come up at different rates uh, of time. So that's the baseline to understand book distribution. Second point, if I keep going on here, is that books change human society, period. That's how systemic change takes place socially in society. It's also how we transport culture across time and geography. Uh, books are the delivery system. They not only transform society. Look at Darwin's uh, theory of evolution. It came from a book. If someone organizes his or her thoughts and puts it in a book and takes the trouble to publish it and what to speak of it gets distributed, the effect is, is generational. So everyone every, uh, everywhere knows about evolution. They write about it regularly in their self-help books. So there's always a point you come to where people say, yeah, this is because we evolved <laughs> in a certain way. And they just accept it. Why? It was in a book. And there are political movements that started. The, the whole American Revolution came from a book, a booklet. It's the highest um, per capita distribution of any book in still to date that was distributed in, in the colonies before the American Revolution that sparked the revolution. There's a book by Thomas Paine called Common Sense. It's a great book, by the way, amazingly written. So the point is, <clears throat> books are what change human society, period. That's why uh, despots burn books. They don't want people to read them because the humans love books. They're going to read them. They're going to get changed. And our books always have their effect. There is no case where the books go in vain. It's impossible. It doesn't happen. It's just a matter of uh, the facility we create around them but that the, the seed will come up in due course of time. So we also have to be ready for that. Hmm. That's true. In one sense, if you consider what you're talking about, the power of books. Recently, I was reading about this book by uh, it's Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He wrote a book called Gulag Arch Archipelago, which described the atrocities in the Soviet concentration camps, which are called gulags. And that book destroyed all the moral credibility whatever the communist regime had that. Mm. So the, it, now many people say that that book brought down the entire Soviet empire. So it's true, books have enormous power. And then that we could say, our books have not just, uh, we have, a, as you said, Tadva Gusargo, that there is spiritual power here, not just intellectual power or power of wisdom. There is the power of Krishna manifesting. So uh, if I understand what, right through the gardening example, you are saying is that, that we cannot set a time frame. And in that sense, we may not be able to quantify that, okay, this book, when will it lead to transformation? But books will have trans effective transformative effect sooner or later. Actually, I'm saying the opposite. If you're a gardener, you can set a time frame. <laughs> That's why gardeners plant at a certain season and they, they, uh, they reap the harvest at a certain time. And it's very scientific. I got a lot. I got a lot more into gardening during the pandemic, especially the beginning, and started noticing and studying up on on you know when do you plant certain things and where when do you transfer the seedling to uh, a bigger uh, bed you know so it doesn't get eaten and so forth. So I think that uh, yes, there is this aspect that, that there may be. Um, an expectation that everything grows all at the same time. I want to see a one-to-one -one correlation uh, measurable. Well, you have to know how to measure it. And gardeners know that. They, they understand the rhythm of things. But there are various elements in gardening that have to be there for you to be successful. Uh, the, and the more you include those ingredients, like starting seeds in 
pristine soil and a nourishing mm -hmm. soil and also knowing when to transfer them to the bigger, uh, not giving too much water, giving just the right amount and protecting from predators. And, you know, every plant has a certain kind of soil that it likes. There are uh, plants like gardenias, they like acidic soil uh, and mm -hmm. other ones will, will not thrive in that. So I think it's, you know, gardening is a science. It's also a mystery. Uh, the, there's the mystery of the seed. I mean, what is a seed anyway? But we're planting seeds. We're gardeners, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, and we can become more expert at gardening. That's beautiful. There is a scientific aspect to it and a mystical aspect to it. The scientific aspect, we can try to replicate as much as possible. And the mystical aspect, we invent says, wait for Krishna's mercy to manifest. <coughs> yes, 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 yes. Thank you. So, for taking this uh, point a little forward, when you said about books, so uh, now, at one in one sense, Prabhupada's books and the message therein is universal and timeless. At the same time, you know, people's language changes to some extent. So, especially for Western audiences, do you find that people can easily relate with Prabhupada's books? Or if we provide the book and then like some Western distributor, book distributor, they told me that the book is what helps us to develop a relationship with them. And when they come with us, come to us, then actually they can, they start diving into the book and then they go deeper. So how, how much, uh, uh, so what all does the book do on the person's spiritual journey, especially that person is from a different culture with a different set of uh, linguistic familiarity and other things? Everybody's different, and some people are, are uh, as you know, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that yesham tanta katam papam jananam punya karmanam te tonva mohanir mukta bhajanti mam drudavrita. Some people have a um, eleva naturally elevated uh, capacity to okay. to read these books and appreciate them right away. Others require uh, time and association and culture. So it, it varies according to the person. And so seeing, um, sorry, so you're seeing this more yes. in terms of people's say uh, orientation in terms of mode and spirituality rather than so much in terms of linguistic familiarity or cultural compatibility or things like that. Well, that's part of it. You know, some people okay. who are born into more kind of Brahminically based families, whether in the East or the West have, uh, more confidence about reading certain types mm -hmm. of things. You know, when they see a, 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 a first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita that has all kinds of uh, proper nouns that they've never heard of before, they don't freak out because they're used to reading the Iliad and the Odyssey or whatever. You know, that's just their mode. Uh, other people, they're going to require somebody to, to walk them through it and explain, explain the processes. But I, I would say this, um, I will say this, that um, Prophet's books are, are potent and we cannot underestimate how powerful they are if people just hear them. Prophet himself said when he first heard his spiritual master, it was difficult for him to understand everything, but he continued to listen. And then everything became crystal clear. Mm. Not my words, crystal clear. But the point is uh, that we cannot... Um, take the uh, very um, clinical you know, view. It's like, well, okay, there's this and that in Prabhupada's books, for instance, vocabulary or certain concepts that may seem archaic to some people in the present day culture uh, and, and then discount them and, and develop a, a mental um, block that like, oh, we can't present Prabhupada's books. Actually, what, what I'm finding is the opposite is that people are hungry to hear the truth. The straightforwardness of Prabhupada's books is refreshing to many people, to most people mm. who have an inkling for spiritual realization. And uh, for instance, Kaushtubha Prabhu and uh, Raghunath have, have proved this. They're very straightforward in their presentation of the Bhagavatam. And thousands of people are tuned in. They like to hear them discuss the controversial topics. It's not a hurdle necessarily if, if you're uh, faithful 
that yes, the potency is in the book and therefore I should present it. At the same time, we are, um, we are uh, duty bound to uh, present uh, what we've heard from Prabhupada's books uh, in a way that people can um, digest them. This is called what Prabhupada says, realization. realization yeah. Same message, not change, not screwing anything out of it, not you know chopping uh, here and there to, to take out uh, certain parts that uh, may may seem odd to us, you know, in the cultural um, context, but uh, representing it in a way that uh, we know through our intelligence and our integration with the same culture be appreciated by, by the audience. And that's our duty. That's what uh, parampara is. And mm -hmm. so we have to do that and make sure that the message gets inculcated uh, into people's hearts, no matter what culture they're from. That's what we're supposed to do. That's why they give, they give us the big bucks, right? <laughs> yeah, big bucks. You know, that's a very true point, what you mentioned about potency. I was thinking when you're speaking about that, that even Prabhupada is praying in Markine Bhagavad Dharma, that song which he composed. Now, Prabhupada is actually saying, make my words understandable to them. So, but what is he saying? About, if you see, he's not really worried about my English pronunciation and this. He's actually thinking, Krishna, you have the potency. You are there in everyone's hearts. And it is by your power that people have gone into illusion. By your power, they can come out of illusion. So make me an instrument for bringing them out of illusion. So we could say that, that these material factors, uh, we can't let them become our own inhibiting blocks. So if we are ourselves diffident about it, then that's what will become a bigger obstacle for people to take the books than what is in the books. So Yes. <laughs> yeah. Such a nice point, Prabhu, because you're on the front line everywhere and uh, you know these things. And uh, I've seen it happen many times when the devotees are being so careful and they're actually holding back. And, and finally, the people kind of like, all right, you give me the real thing. <laughs> Where's the other stuff? <laughs> you know, they become uh, forceful in that. It's like, tell us where the place is. You know, we want to go there and, and tell us all the stuff. Yeah, you know, this I had an experience. We had uh, brought some Western yoga students to a tour of India. We went to Vindavan and uh, <clears throat> uh, a couple of other places. So we went to Vindavan and we tried to give a very rational presentation of Krishna lifting Vrindavan. These are completely new people. They knew nothing. But then afterwards, they were asking us, oh, tell us what is the story behind this place? So, <laughs> so they didn't, the idea that the miraculous events happened, that was, we, we thought they will have a bigger problem with it than what they had. They, they were just eager to know. Now, in one sense, it's not that they are going to immediately believe it and accept it. But if they have come to that place, they want to know, okay, what, what attracts people to this place? So in that sense, sometimes we may have more hesitation than what is warranted. And uh, so another point you mentioned was very striking that the straightforwardness of Prabhupada's presentation is also appealing. That's one of the things which struck me also in my spiritual journey many years ago that it was what Prabhupada wants us to do is very clear from his books. I had read other spiritual books. It is all feel good, motivation, inspiration. But at the end, what, what am I supposed to do? That, that was never very clear. <laughs> <laughs> good point. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good point. There's something very clear to do at the end. <laughs> that's true. And then the other point which you mentioned was also that it's our responsibility to present. So I think that, that happens in both ways. If the book distributors are themselves trained and they are they have heard and chanted then they are inspired to go out they will present appealingly and then also if there is a channel for people to connect then at those places their questions and whatever they have they will get a more appealing presentation so yes Prabhu. and i also say we shouldn't feel uh hesitant to experiment uh and we also shouldn't feel bad if we if we don't immediately connect with our audience Look at the, in the context of Srila Vyasadeva himself. Why did he have that uh, conversation and uh, hear stern words from his guru, Narada Muni? He was, Srila Vyasadeva, searching for the, the right message. 
if he has to search for it, according to the particular era he's presenting in, then uh, we certainly will also. And this is the preoccupation of those engaged in the parampara. They're constantly, like if you have two knobs, a uh, godbrother of mine gave this example, I really like it. Uh, like in a shower where you have two knobs, mm. uh, hot and cold. So mm-hmm. like you're trying to get the shower just right, you know, uh, and, <laughs> and, and a little more. Eh, eh, eh. And so preachings like that, constantly <laughs> adjusting the knobs, like, is that hot now? Oops, too hot. Like, now that's too cold. So get it just right for the, for the audience. That's a memorable example. I think we can easily every day remember that when we take a bath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a, sometimes I say that, you know, there's faithfulness and there is resourcefulness. You know, both mm. are required. Faithfulness to connect us with our tradition and resourcefulness to connect with our contemporary society. And uh, so which one we need to, maybe I'm not being resourceful enough. That knob needs to be turned on a little bit more. So... That's so true. I like it. And a lot, a lot, nice. is that the, you talk about Vyasadeva. I never thought of that pastime in this way. So it was not that Vyasadeva was wrong. Uh, it was just that he, you could, what you, the way you put it was that he was, uh, he was searching for the way and the way he adopted was what Nadima told you. Oh, that's not, that's not what, what you should be doing. So it's, it, that's a much more, you could say, accessible and relevant understanding of that. And also more respectful because they would not go wrong, but he was just thinking what would benefit people the most. Mm. Well, if I may quote uh, one of my uh, mentors, especially in writing, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, uh, write fat. <laughs> uh, because a, a, a phrase you told me in Mayapur when we met, it resonates with me every single day. And that is, you can never edit a blank page, but you can always edit Uh, a bad page. And so, uh, you know, don't hesitate just because you see some fault in your presentation or, you know, you have some mental block, you go ahead and present. You can always refine it later. And when else are you going to refine it? Uh, uh, Other than when you find some reaction that you weren't expecting that that goes not the way you wanted it to. And so we, we have to move forward. We have to go out and preach. And if our preaching isn't perfect, how are you going to perfect it? Unless you, you know, you're, you're writing fat, write fat. That's, I'm going to get a tattoo someday, right, maybe right. next life. And uh, <laughs> maybe be, be your words, Chaitanya Charm Prabhu, yeah. write fat and Prabhu. edit later as you go. Thank you. you know, I'm, I'm humble that I could be of some service or rather, Don't what mind. I spoke, it's I never thought of it that in the broader, broader context of preaching. I thought of it more in terms of writing only. But that's true. And recently, I was talking with one devotee who had written an article and he thought it would be a very good article and nobody appreciated it. So he was a little disappointed. So I made the same point that you know, instead of seeing it as a failure, you can see it as feedback. That, you know, okay, it's not that you didn't get a result. You just didn't get the result that you expected. So, okay, I need to tune it. I'm going to share the example of the knob with him now. So that's beautiful. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's not, it's never over till it's over anyway. I, I mean, I've given classes that I, I hated my, the class I gave. And then someone will come up to me later and go, that, that changed my life, you know, that thing you said. And it's like, well, you know, it's not my business to hate what I do. It's my business to try to present according to what I've heard in Parampara and then, uh, you know, it's not a beauty contest. And, and if and if it touches somebody, then, you know, the job is done. Not a beauty contest. Huh? <laughs> That's an amazing way of putting it. <laughs> uh, yeah, what we are doing doesn't have to, say, win awards or look beautiful. It, we're just doing a, we are doing a service and people will benefit it. That's, I think this is so important that because especially in today's social media world, comparison becomes so easy. Now, I put a video and how many views have come for my video? Somebody else has put a video. How many views have come for that video? So yeah. it's created a lot of, uh, lot of unnecessary comparison and insecurity because of that. So remembering that... Uh, oh, I like that. Comparison insecurity. I'm taking that one. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So... So just uh, 
going back to an earlier point which you had mentioned about book distribution to community so you said that it is going to happen and you mentioned that as gardeners we can actually put a time frame but it's just that there are different seeds and different seeds will require require different time frames so in general say in silicon valley when you uh, when you distribute books you, you how does the journey work are there some introductory programs that those who read books can come to or how is the is there a trajectory for a person who has received a book to uh, connect with the community further there is a trajectory if we design for it and therefore the preaching outreach is unlimited because we're always filling the gaps in the bridge and we ha- we have to look at it as as a holistic approach in order to be successful and so what i always like to do is find the gaps and then brainstorm how to fill them for instance when we meet uh, a, let's just say a western person who's oriented towards uh, self realization but it's not so dialed into uh, what a hari krishna temple looks like inside especially if it's all one culture and so mm. okay where is the next landing place that this person can come to in order to uh, imbibe the philosophy and at the same time not be disoriented uh, feel disoriented mm. and in in designing for that that's where we flesh out the holistic process for presenting krishna consciousness and so we have to be looking at that and if you draw it in a diagram it's like okay here's the gap and there's a way to fill it uh if i don't identify the gap i can't fill it and uh, this is one of the ways in business management you look for the obstacles and then brainstorm how to go around the obstacle and once you do that then there's no uh no restriction in how you can grow so it's the same thing for our, for our outreach we have to find the gaps and fill them that's beautiful so so in one sense you are taking the bridge metaphor and expanding it further so we may build a bridge but how comfortable how safe how continuous is the bridge that so if there are gaps in it people may come half the way but they may not want to come further ahead Yeah, this they may take a step and then fall in the river. <laughs> you know, it's like, hey, we just lost another one. It's like, well, why don't you fix the bridge? Yeah, there's a go- there's a, hole, a gaping hole in it. Fix it. Yes, true. So, Prabhu, uh, when we talk about this bridge and the way you have designed it, so how much does uh, organization play a role at one level? Devotees are individuals, and everybody like needs to be individually inspired to distribute books. but at the same time having kind of some kind of structured approach also enables to coordinate and uh, uh, execute and assess so how do you balance between a structure and say individual initiative and freedom in book distribution especially and in the community at large yes well what i uh, conceived these four laws of book distribution the first is your sudden and must be strong the second is you must get books because you can't distribute books you don't have the third is you the more you show the more you sell and the fourth is you must organize and when uh managers are organizing and people feel naturally a, a naturally uh, harmonious environment there's a uh, there's a uh, a a paradigm explaining this in in corporate management that if people feel that conditions are getting worse in their environment then they quit if they feel that they're staying the same then they do just what they have to and if people feel that the facility is ever increasing then they do more than they have to and oh. so when we we have this uh, program called ABS always better service and so we look for the rooms for improvement after every event and we make a list and then we say we have to make at least three improvements every month that's our quota so okay. big or small doesn't matter but when people show up and they feel sometimes they don't even notice it specifically but they feel like i think it's a little better than it was last time then they're encouraged to do more than they have to and this is uh the power of organization for instance when going out for book distribution the most difficult part is just going out 
It's the logistics of giving, getting one, everyone out the door, uh, books in cars, going to a particular place. And that is supply chain management, transportation. It's very logistical, just like in the military. They have people that specialize in these things. And the more we're specialized in it, the more the experience of the person who walks out the door, gets in the car, is uh, unencumbered. And therefore, uh, they want to do it again. And so we, we have to organize in ways of, for the community, for specific services, so that it's always improving, always better service. And if we don't have that, then life becomes either boring or uh, depressing. So we, we have to use organization in order to uh, create a, an encouraging environment. Oh, okay, so this is an amazing vision. So organization is not so much about say controlling or restricting people, but it's more of organizing for facilitating people. So if the nectar is in book distribution, then if they have to worry about and they get unpleasant experiences with the just logistics of getting the books and going out, then that will deter them. So we could it would almost say that it's like in Krishna Katha, uh, when we are giving a class, it is we are not inhibiting the speaker in what they speak and the interaction between the speaker and the audience, but we need to have good sound system, we need to have a reasonably comfortable place to sit for everyone and so organization is meant for that the taking care of the logistics so that the essential krishna conscious exchange can happen so that's what i think you are saying applies for exactly also. exactly like the example going back to hearing and chanting if if our main process is hearing and chanting how much facility are we uh, creating for that to happen for instance if you go into a temple room and the microphone doesn't work, or it takes five minutes, you waste five perfectly good minutes trying to get it to work, uh, and people can't hear you, and, uh, uh, and also you can't broadcast it properly, then uh, your service is not complete. Hmm. So uh, I would say, you know, we're always looking for an edge on how to create a better environment for hearing and chanting. And it makes a huge, huge difference. This is organization. So we find the core principle. What are we trying to promote? And then build the facility uh, unlimitedly around that. In other words, unlimitedly refine it, make it better, always be on the cutting edge. That's what's exciting. And that's what drives a movement is we're taking what we're supposed to be doing, the core principle, and then we're organizing around it. Organization should follow the, the core principle. For instance, preaching is our, is our core value and activity, and we should manage to facilitate the outreach. That's organization. Otherwise, you get the uh, tail bureaucracy. wagging the dog. Tail wagging yeah. the dog. Okay. Bureaucracy, yeah. That's true. It's a good example. <laughs> bureaucracy, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Which, which, kills, which kills the spirit. Of, of the organization. Prabhupada said that uh, you should create an environment in which people want to do service as individual, spontaneous, and voluntary. By the way, that's what ISV stands for. That's our <laughs> internal um, uh, mission yeah. statement, individual, spontaneous, and voluntary. It also stands for ISKCON of Silicon Valley, but that, that's the mode uh, uh, that facilitates a community, uh, uh, organization based on how to make that happen. You know, somehow I had I talked about individuals for today's voluntary, but I had thought of that I had come up with the acronym ISV. I thought I'll share with you sometime, but you you're already using it. That's wonderful. <laughs> 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 so Prabhu, since you brought this up, uh, you know, you are in Silicon Valley. That's one of the you could say one of the most progressive, competitive places in the world. It sets the trends for America and the world. So are there any special challenges or opportunities for book distribution and overall sharing Krishna consciousness in Silicon Valley. The one thing that I noticed is that uh, I haven't seen any other place in the world where we have regular programs going on in Fortune 500 companies or like Google and Intel and other is, um, Salesforce and all those companies. And you have monthly programs going on and people are coming and getting cultivated. But are there any special challenges and opportunities in that particular place? 
Uh, yeah, there, there are lots of opportunities to speak to uh, entrepreneurial type people or people who are well-educated and have good jobs, but then feel that they're not getting everything they want out of life. I mean, that's the biggest opportunity is people have uh, the job that they always dreamed of. They're making the money they always wanted to make, but then they're not happy. That's a great opportunity because uh, they're going like, what happened? There must be something else. They may not be overtly spiritual, but they still have this inquiring spirit and they want to hear some kind of presentation that tells them why they are suffering and why they're not getting what they want out of life. And so that's a huge opportunity around Silicon Valley because of its supposed affluence. Mm. But I find that people are rather stifled because, you know, they get into these jobs and they have to work a lot harder than they thought they'd work. They don't have time for themselves. Even though they got money, they don't have a life and uh, they don't like it. And they want something more. And, it, and we're able to tell them, it's like, we have it. We have an oasis. You can, you can um, visit and um, you can apply these principles to your life and you'll get what you're actually looking for. And they love that, that, um, that message. Mm. That's true. Even in India, I've seen that there are certain demographics where we have been able to reach a lot of people. Engineering students is one. And then software people are also another. So what you said in one sense that you get something that you want and then you find that it's not what you thought it would be. So that creates an opening in the veil of illusion that people want to inquire. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Where else are they going to go? They don't have any other place to go. They got the best of everything here and now it's not enough. So there must be another answer. That's sort of the opening for a lot of people here in Silicon Valley. So, so in, in, the, in the company programs that I have seen, so how did that start off? Is it that because devotees were working there, they invited you and they organized a program or because yes. that is quite distinctive and how has it been growing over time? It started with devotees who have... Uh, jobs in corporations. Corporations nowadays are very much open to uh, giving their employees various um, trainings in um, uh, being more efficient in life, even spiritual perspectives, not religious so much. Uh, many companies are highly resistant to that because they, mm -hmm. they know that sectarianism will arise. So you have to uh, present uh, like spiritual technology. Uh, Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we had a few guest speakers uh, come in various places and employees of those companies were able to invite them. For instance, His Holiness Radha Swami would come and speak at, at a place. And then we realized there's an opening to uh, systematize that. And we started the Conscious Living Network. And that spread to many, many uh, um, uh, corporations around the valley. So then because... Uh, I was here, I, would, I started going to those places uh, weekly. I'd speak at Google, I'd speak at Salesforce, Intel on a regular basis in front of an audience and people would come uh, to a, uh, a meeting room, uh, sometimes with a stage. And then, you know, we do PowerPoints and present live. And we noticed that it was well received. And then, of course, during the pandemic, when everyone got locked down, we were able to transfer that audience online. And that became our spiritual fitness uh, broadcast that happens every Friday. And uh, from there, uh, we've, we saw that there was a need to, uh, there were very sincere seekers who were coming every week, you know, month after month. And then they started moving to our uh, bhakti community where they're getting a uh, very straightforward Krishna consciousness. And many of them now are practicing. Uh, and we also found that we, even during the corporate programs that I was going to live, people were very open to learning uh, mantra meditation. And uh, they, we would have an extra class after my uh, presentation to show them how to do mantra meditation. So, for instance, at, at uh, Salesforce in San Francisco, we had a group of 24 people at one mm -hmm. time chanting Japa together, meeting regularly you know, at work to chant. 
So um, that that's how it started and how it continues now. That's amazing that people are chanting Japa in their office hours and the company is facilitating that. that Prabhupada would be so pleased. So much you. facilitating, you know, the, the, uh, the head of Salesforce has this ethos that he will, he gives a portion of his profits, company profits to good causes. And he also has created meditation rooms on the, in, in those big buildings downtown San Francisco. So people can repair to those rooms and uh, do meditation and stuff. Yes, and I, they, when I had a spoken at Salesforce. The devotees took me to those rooms. I was amazed. So, oh right, once, yeah, that's right. You went yeah. There. yeah, so it's a, so it's a, it just requires what you earlier said, like non-sectarian presentation. If we do, then there are a lot of opportunities to reach out to people, even in elite circles. Yes, that's true. And. Uh, uh, Maybe one or two last questions. I don't want to hold you up for too long. So since we are talking about, and this is Bhadra Purnima is coming up and book distribution. Uh, we're talking, we just emphasize often just trying to distribute Bhagavatam and entire Bhagavatam sets at this time. So two questions about this. Uh, from what, as far as I have read, Prabhupada didn't, re, during Prabhupada's time, Bhadra Purnima was not, not really celebrated. So do we see this as an example of Yukta Vairagya? using this festival in, in devotional service? Of course, it is mentioned in the tradition, but Prabhupada did not emphasize it so much, or is it that just our movement has evolved to a place where we can do this, and earlier it was not that easily possible? Regarding Bhadra Purnima, it's yet another excuse to have a, a time-bound goal for distributing books. Hmm. Book distribution is quantifiable. It's, it's one of the uh, aspects of book distribution that makes it so uh, expandable is it's measurable. Whatever is measurable can be increased. <laughs> and uh, part of measurement means there has to be a goal. And so uh, we're always looking for goals uh, and an end point where devotees can measure. After all, if you go out into the world, when I go for my morning walk, I notice there's a basketball court, then there's a, there's a football field, and there's a baseball field. They all have lines on them. And in the football field, they have a goal post. Uh, without that, you just have a vast universe with uh, unlimited space. And as humans, we don't know what to do with that. So when we have a good excuse for a, a time-bound goal that's a good excuse means that it's highly spiritual. We like to lean into that. So we've had for years this um, Gita Jayanti, which now we call World Gita Day, mm. so that it's more accessible to, to people in a wider level. And it's been very successful because there's a good excuse to glorify the Bhagavad Gita and distribute Bhagavad Gita for Gita Jayanti or World Gita Day. Under our nose all these years was this Bhadra Purnima. I read the verse in the Bhagavatam in the 12th canto, 13th chapter, 13th verse, that says, if you give away a Bhagavatam on this particular day, you go to the supreme destination. So in one of our brainstorming sessions, which we have regularly, like, how do we increase from here? Uh, we discussed this. And I said, how about this as a new uh, Gita Jayanti for Bhagavatams? And immediately resonated. And, and we set out to uh, put that as a, as a reasonable goal. And we had a, a modicum of success the first couple of years. It resonated with some devotees. And then during the pandemic in 2020, it just took off like a rocket. We had a goal of distributing at least 10,000 sets of Bhagavatams, which we made pre-pandemic in Tirupati at the GBC uh, meeting. <laughs> and uh, we thought that that was a lofty goal at the time because we had only hit 7,000. And 3,000 is a lot of Bhagavatams. It's a big gap. So... Uh, we pronounced, and the videotape is there, that we are going to distribute 10,000. And then the, the pandemic started. And so many people said, well, I mean, now obviously it can't be done. But 
uh, when we when you start with the idea that it can be done, anything can be done, you just have to work backwards from that assumption. So we work backward from the assumption that it can be done, and we figured out how to do it. And the technology to distribute Bhagavatams under lockdown spread all over the world. And we were able to communicate with people all over the world through Zoom. And we found it found a, a, the development of a tighter network, tighter than we've ever had before on a global level. And we smashed that goal. We did over 20,000 Bhagavatam sets. And so for this year, we set the, uh, again, uh, impossible goal of 20, 25,000 sets of Bhagavatams. And Prabhu, we have like a, one week left to September 20th. So we ask everyone to participate and everything counts. That's our philosophy is a lot of devotees each doing a little bit and working together uh, for a, a global goal. Uh, so competition doesn't need to be pushed so hard that we're working against one another. And competition is naturally there. It's a product of us being individual souls. So uh, nowadays, it's very helpful to look in terms of unification. And uh, this Bhajra Purnima is a way that we can unify the world around this common goal. And that's happening. And we're going to smash it again. And we're going to continue smashing it uh, around the world as we incrementally increase the goal for Bhadra Purnima. So everyone who wants to be part of this, uh, the historic, it's never been done before. No one's ever distributed 25,000 sets of Bhagavatams. I guarantee you, it's never happened in the history of the world. And so you can be a part of this historic program. Yes, that's true. I, last year when I heard about 20,000, I was stunned because it was extraordinary. And I loved the statement that what he said, instead of saying it can't be done, let's start with it can be done and then work backward. And I think Prabhupada, Prabhupada also called impossible as a word in the fool's dictionary. So, yes. So, I, again, this point about so Bhadra Purnima, you, still, you said you started it about four or five years ago or was it uh, something? Yeah, four years ago. Four years started ago. four years ago and it, there were only a few participants uh, India, Bhima Prabhu was into it. He got it going in India a little bit here and there because they're already, you know, motivated there because of the really good leadership and uh, uh, a little bit in UK and America. But then now it's universal. It's become a big thing all over the world. Every continent has gotten into it. And we've or organized around the principle. So once you have an end point and a, and a goal, then you can get everybody into it. And, Yes, true. And again, the way we view it is, it's not just because of the numbers, although we look at numbers a lot, but it's what it makes of us to achieve the goal. The, the effects of reaching a goal together in book distribution has a systemic beneficial effect in the whole community. It makes the whole community better. We discover technologies that we didn't have before when we work towards a common goal. I'll give one example of NASA, when they build a rocket, the systems of management they build around developing technology that has to be so precise so the rocket doesn't crash, uh, become universally available later. Like management and that's taught in universities uh, comes a, a lot from NASA because of the way they've developed uh, systems for management to, to develop these rockets that shoot off. And then those technologies get exported to all kinds of other um, enterprises. And so in a similar way, as we're, developing to, as we're developing ourselves to achieve these goals, that becomes part of our community, uh, our ethos, the way we work together and, uh, and the systems become widely available to everybody. So, this is how we improve in ISKCON. And Prabhupada put it like this. He said, always create a fresh challenge so that the devotees will want to rise up and meet it. And uh, there's another aspect to this. And that is that we're dependent on Lord Chaitanya's mercy to expand the Sankirtan movement. Mm. Uh, Srila Prabhupada gave us the means through which to spread the movement through his book distribution. And he also showed us by example that nothing's impossible. So now 
every time we set a goal that seems impossible, but we smash it, we get faith that we're not doing it. It's Lord Chaitanya that's doing it. And meanwhile, our capacity increases. So we have this saying that the numbers don't really matter that much. It's just a little more than we did before because birds fly in the sky as high as they're able, but the sky is unlimited. So what we're looking for universally, globally, is that we all increase our capacity. And as we do, we become a better movement. How much better? It's unlimited. We have to keep refining and getting better. Otherwise, everyone will get bored and go somewhere else. It has to be fresh. That's beautiful, Ro. That, so when Prabhupada said, create a fresh challenge, and this is a very stand, striking example of this. So what you did, your vision and your, you could say, I could say, divine passion for book distribution, you translated into a tangible a goal that is both tangible and traditional. And now Bhadrapurnam, as you said, it's, it's just to become one of the major events in our movement's calendar. And everybody's electrified by it. So I think it's a debt that the movement, whole movement owes to you for creating this uh, exciting challenge and opportunity for all of us. So oh, it just turns out that it's a perfect, uh, it's a perfect occasion because it's got the scriptural backing, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it's so, it's so uh, clearly stated in that verse, uh, distribute a Bhagavatam, go back to Godhead, basically. I mean, yeah. it doesn't get much better than that. So <laughs> these opportunities are here, there, and everywhere. But unless we have this uh, sense of urgency that, you know, we have to increase book distribution, then we don't see them. When the necessity is there, that's when we discover these types of things. And so we have to keep that pressure on our, ourselves. And to do that, we set these uh, goals here, there, and everywhere. And we have to keep calibrating them so everyone feels they're fresh. Because after a while, then people go, they, they start getting a nimagraha. Yeah, we did it that last year. It has to be a fresh look every time. Otherwise, why are we, a movement's got to be exciting. If people have to feel like they're pioneering, they're going somewhere, they're hitting new benchmarks. Otherwise, we just become bureaucratic and bored and start looking to how to fight with one another about stupid things. So book distribution is a way to rise above the, the uh, pettiness that, uh, is the default mode in Kali Yuga. Unless we have a higher cause to work for, like Bhajra Purnima, we're just going to end up uh, arguing about all kinds of um, non-essential matters. Beautiful. In one sense, what the Bhagavatam says is that the Bhagavatam is actually going to give us the vision to overcome the effects of Kali. So you can say distributing Bhagavatam also affects, uh, helps us to counter the Effects of Kali in terms of causing dissension. That's a beautiful note uh, to end on. I would love to have you again and talk more, but I respect your time. And uh, maybe towards the end, I I usually try to summarize in the podcast. And if if you're okay, I'll summarize in a few minutes and then you can add some concluding words if you like. Okay. So, So today we discussed about, in many ways, Book Bhadrapurni was the occasion we discussed book distribution as the as the foundation or the engine we could say for for community building and spreading Krishna consciousness both. So he started by talking about how book distribution was in the early days also a community activity, but then as the nature of the community changed, devotees moved from the temple to outside. Then we had to, in a sense, refashion book distribution as a family activity. And that has opened doors for people when people in the whole family go, go door to door, people ready to open it. People are much more open to that. And then as that started growing, also that one of the most eye-opening things was the kids' book distribution. Those five, five-year-olds is something which is etched in my memory now. So it not only attracts people, it lowers their guard when they say kids are speaking about Krishna and wanting to take the book, but also forms the develops communication skills, emotional, emotional intelligence, handling rejection, and a whole set of skills are developed in the kids. And that helps them also to safely transit from the, you could say the almost somewhat insular world of Krishna consciousness to the mainstream world, which they will eventually encounter in colleges and in their later lives. So that was amazing. And then you said that the main purpose of distribution is actually our own transformation. 
because we have to we have to say we have to become comfortable outside our comfort zone as you said and book distribution means we do that it's like a topmost form of sadhana where in which we it transforms us and the uh, books that are distributed in once as a secondary they will happen we just show up the more we show up the more we'll be able to distribute i like the four laws also which you stated that very it was like a comprehensive program you start with your sadhana then get the books and then show up for distributing the books and then organize and the principle of organization which you mentioned is that if it facilitates the logistics either of book distribution or of hearing then that is what is desirable otherwise it will become bureaucratic so in one sense if you consider bhadra purnima as example of organization the organization is actually creating a fresh challenge and making krishna consciousness exciting otherwise it becomes boring and we start quarreling over petty things and in between you talked about how the culture of hearing you heard from prabhupa that don't you should also read my books the culture of hearing that is start with what was possible for devotees say twice a week or once a week twice a week now thrice a week and now virtually so many programs are happening and uh, so hearing gives us we talk about symbiosis between hearing on one side and uh, sharing on the other side so when we do both together sharing inspires us to hear more hearing, hearing inspires us to share and book distribution while doing book distribution we may have that apprehension that okay that is the language or the vocabulary or the con- concepts are cake but there is a spiritual potency beyond it all and if we are confident then that will attract people and of course it's our responsibility to make an appealing presentation and from book distribution to say heart transformation community building it's our responsibility to build, build a bridge and specifically find out what are the gaps in the bridge and fill that so in silicon it's fascinating also that you said indians can do western outreach they've been quite effective there's uh, rather than the indianness being a barrier it can be like a badge of authenticity so that can inspire people to open okay this is what you are this is what you have been practicing and that was fascinating also and we talked about how there can be different uh, habitats so initial contact can be by anyone but eventually the habitats can be different and saddleback church you talked about but now if people are to come together eventually then the everybody has to have that that ethos that kind of understanding that this is not just a place for us to congregate and with our friends but the priority is new people are coming and we need to welcome them and then you also talked about reflective hearing how it inspires and engages the devotees how you say spontaneously develop that and silicon valley also is a place where it's in one sense you could say the the ripest place because people are people are achieved everything what they dreamt of materially but their life is not what they dreamt about so it also i think that's the world's unparalleled program where so many top companies and you have created a channel from the conscious living network to the direct bhakti program and in presenting in this way we need that balance the two the two knobs in the bathroom too hot or too cold so we are faithful and resourceful both together and bhadra purnima is you could say it's vaisheshika prabhu's gift to the iskon world or rather discovery from our tradition and we just need uh in one sense an excuse of, and this is a perfect traditional basis for us to inspire each other to distribute books distribute especially the bhagavatam and it's amazing 20000 books have been distributed and we can smash records so two points you said that we try to do the we try to hit the numbers but the point is when we try to hit them that gives us the realization that it is their mercy the lord's mercy that is doing it and that increases our faith also so it is a vibrant spiritual experience for us to see the current of krishna consciousness going through one of the points you made also we have to reach to new people that renew we vicariously experience the newness of krishna consciousness we bhadra purnima is the opportunity to do that so thank you very much prabhu any concluding words you would like to share yes that uh it sounds better when you say it <laughs> and whenever i'm around you or listening to you i i realize i'm in the presence of spiritual genius i d- i so deeply appreciate uh the way you uh take language and utilize it to present krishna conscious uh principles in such accessible and interesting ways and uh i'm i'm so grateful that you're on the planet uh doing what you're doing 
Prabhu, I admire your work. I get so much from you. And uh, I thank you very, very, very much for giving me uh, time to talk to you. It's, it's always, always uplifting for me. Sure. I'm humbled by your words. You are Sorry for that. For the whole it, planet. Came for, it came straight from my heart, so I just had to tell you. Hare thank Krishna. You, I, seek, I see your words as Prabhupada's blessings and your blessings, that I can also get that energy to keep sharing Krishna consciousness. I, tend, I play with words, I tend to get caught in the head. But that zeal to share, I can feel it just through the digital medium by your association. Thank you very much for sharing your wisdom and sparing your time. I look forward to having you again sometime in future uh, for discussing more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prabhu. Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. Keep up the great work. And uh, always, always uh, so eager to have your association. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.